Greetings, Facebook friends. I'm just announcing that I'm not going to do any more political posts on Facebook. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Those of you that haven't already unfriended me are probably quite happy. Why? Not because I'm going less political. I'm going more, but not here. Facebook will only be for flamenco, technology, and the arts, and company announcements, but no politics. And where I'm headed, I'm creating platforms for liberals, former liberals, libertarians, and anarchists. It's a romantic term, isn't it? Anarchists. There will also be a Spanish language channel for Latinos of all backgrounds. Those websites will be announced shortly. Uh, but this is dedicated to all my liberal friends and colleagues. I've been surrounded by you all my life. So let's start off with Jonas. Actually, Jonte. Ah, I've known him since I was 12 years old. We met in Venezuela. Definitely left of center. Dr. Carolina, one of the finest people I've ever met in my life. My mentor, the university. She was a former communist. Then she became spiritual, and uh, frankly, her, right in front of my eyes, her, friend, her colleagues would make fun of her. She was wonderful. Bill the Bulldog Stewart. Never let a bureaucrat get in his way. Definitely left of center, very left of center. Alfonso, I've never even met him. Seems like a great guy. Left of center. I could go on and on. All my good friends throughout my uh, life, I've been surrounded by liberals. And so I want to dedicate this to you. Now, there's a method to my madness. So the purpose of this post and what I'm going to talk about, I need to first start off with my background. For those of you who don't know the whole background, here it is in a nutshell. Uh, Cuban-American, my mother's Cuban, my father's American, Anglo-Saxon. Uh, I was, went to first grade in Cuba. I was there right after the revolution. I remember a whole lot. And of course, I have my cousins, Fernando, Armando, my tia, oh my gosh, my tia Maita, tia Norma. This is my abuelo, my abuela. Yeah, I, I know, I know, you liberals have kind of a fetish for the, uh, you know, the other, but uh, and we didn't really need that because we were surrounded by it all the time. My ex-wife is Jewish. Uh, one thing about my family, and you're seeing little pictures of them going back and forth quickly, is that uh, you cannot tell their politics by their ethnicity. I know, I know, that's, that's, that troubles a lot of you, I know, I know, but that, that, that's, that's the way it is. Uh, the very, very black may or may not be liberal. The very white may not be. Everybody in between, you don't know. And that's really how it should be. I know it's not the way you guys like it, but it's the way it should be. My PhD is in the humanities. I know your rhetoric better than you. It's origins, it's methodology. I've been inundated it for decades now. I know where your memes come from, what specific school. You know, like, no tolerance for the intolerant. That's my cues. He was a sick fellow. He belonged to a very sick organization. But I digress. Like I said, I wrote a real dissertation, 600 pages, cutting edge. So why am I telling you this? I should have come out a commissar, right? Or at least a dupe. What happened? Hmm? What happened? I'm obviously one of you, Mr. and Mrs. Liberal. Like I said, I've been around you all my life. So why don't I think like you? In 30 years since I started the drift from the uh, mainstream liberal, I have never been asked that question. Think about it. Not once. From you tolerant, broad-minded, inclusive people. I've been surrounded by you my entire life, from adolescent on, and I've never been asked that question. We know you, believe me, we know you real well.
We can hardly escape your screeching, virtue signaling, and self-righteous ranting. I mean, really. But you don't have a clue as to who I am or people who think like I do. How did that happen? From such inclusive, virtuous, compassionate, don't give in to hate kind of people. How is it you don't have a clue who we are? You run around with cliches in your mind, cartoon characters, rednecks, KKK, racist, fascist, blah, 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 blah. See, that's what happened in 2016. No need to look for white supremacists, everybody, fascists, deplorables. We were there the entire time, right in front of you. There's more of us than you realize. You didn't see it coming because people of your persuasion act like ideological maniacs. Come on, admit it. You people are so ugly and belligerent that the average conservative, or just anyone who doesn't think like you, just nods their head, mm -hmm, smiles at you while you bark and rant, and then responds at the voting booth. I'm doing this now, um, it's Halloween, oh, happy Halloween. I was hoping to get it all together and published by now, but uh, I don't know who's, who's going to win the election. It's neither here nor there. I mean, we both know that whoever wins, the resistance will continue from whichever side. It's just the way it's going to be. Yeah, we're, we're getting to a crossroads. You woke up in 2016 screaming about where in the hell did all these racist, rednecks, fascist, something phobes come from. Right? Right? but we were there the, uh, the entire time. You just didn't have a clue who we were. There's no need to look for KKK members, Nazis, and phobics. Sorry. We were right in front of you the whole time. Many of us, like myself, voted for Obama both times, by the way. Yeah, I still get letters from the Obama uh, organization or whatever. Don't open them now, but I still get them. Hillary lost to states that had not voted Republican in decades. Those people suddenly became Nazis? They became deplorables overnight because they didn't vote your way? Really? You know, if you're looking at Europe, if you get out of your bubble, you'll see that in the last couple of years, the same thing happened there. There are parts of Italy and England that had not voted outside of the Labour or Communist Party in 50 years. All of a sudden turn to the populist nationalists. But they just suddenly became racist. It never occurred to you to ask any of us. Of course not, because you're taught not to. Believe me. Believe me, I know how you think. <laughs> how could I not? Right up to here, believe me. You're taught not to at the universities. So most people who didn't think like you didn't bother to talk to you either. What a surprise, huh? But because I'm so much like you, whether we like it or not, me or you, I'm a belligerent, self-righteous, pompous-ass creature of the university system. Yeah. A belligerent, self-righteous, pompous-ass creature of the university system. Just like you. I'm as belligerent as you are. That's how come you know how I think. Well, you don't really know how I think. You just don't. I don't think like you. That's all you know but you do know. I've been surrounded by people like you all my life, but you don't know why I don't think like you. Of course not. You never asked. 30 years, everybody, you have never asked. The universities and your media has taught you not to think at all. You have no critical thinking, which is really funny because Critical thinking or critical analysis is like a, dis, a, a discipline in the universities. Uh, don't get me started there. So what I'm saying is that we know you only too well. You don't have a clue who we are. How could you possibly know? If a black person even questions you, you tell him he's not black. That's right. An old white man tells a black man on public television... He's not really black if he doesn't vote for him. 
You've got another lady who uh, pretends to be an Indian. She ran for president. Another one somewhere on the, the West Coast who pretended to be black. But when a real black person does it both the way you want, he's not really black. It's called the social construction of identity. Believe me, I know this crap inside out. <sighs> Do you understand how crazy you people look to us? Do you have any clue how crazy you look to us? Because we watch you. How can we not? You're such a spectacle. So now we got those mostly peaceful hyenas in the streets. You notice how lately, even CNN, NBC, they don't even... They don't even cover them anymore. Hey, they're still after everybody. Don't pretend you don't know them. It's a bit late for that. Your party unleashed them, supported them, but pretended not to until it all started to backfire. And it's a bit too late for that. Soros and Company, all those cities are run by Soros and Company's, uh, what you call the uh, city councils. They've been working on this for 20 years. The district attorneys. Imagine you've got some anarchists that in Seattle, when they did the chop, they got the walls put in place by the city. Oh, Mr. and Mrs. Anarchist, where would you like the walls? Well, over here? Okay. And then you guys manned them <laughs> with people with automatic rifles. So you built walls, manned them with checkpoints with automatic rifles, and then you shot a bunch of people, all of them, people of color. <laughs> Man, you can't make this stuff up. It's too good. Yeah. Yeah. Remember when the CNN guy was telling them it was mostly peaceful uh, protests and there was a fire going on behind him? That's why they don't even cover it anymore. It's a joke. It's ridiculous. And don't, don't pretend you don't know those people. Because guess what? Those same hyenas in the streets we've been dealing with right here on Facebook for years. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You descend on people in these little petty mobs, you know, frothing at the mouth. They're racist, fascist. Oh, yeah. Now, some lady thought she was a Roma. She was telling me I couldn't use the word gitano, gypsy. That it's like the N-word, like, what the a real gypsy from Spain named my song Sueños y Donalds, Gypsy Dreams. What is she talking about, this idiot? Then she went on to say, oh, the Spanish gypsies don't know that. Oh, please, please. This lady was a PhD, so you know, uh, you know. Yeah, socially constructed. She was a socially constructed Roma. But I've got, I've been in lots of this. You're not really Latino if you're, if you're against, uh, if you're not for no borders, right? If you're not for unrest un unrestrained uh, immigration, you must be a uh, weekend Latino. Really? Not some Latinos are not for it. Who the hell are you to tell us who you are? Come on. No borders, no walls, no USA at all. Right? Right? Well, that's what'll happen. But you're taught not to ask because you can't listen to hate speech. Racism, no tolerance for the intolerant. Yeah, Marcuse in the uh, Frankfurt School, but I mean it, it was going on before then. This this is a redundant old story that just keeps getting better and better in its own perverse way. But what if I do know something you don't know? I mean, wouldn't it be worth just getting it a listen? I mean, if you follow me this far, why not? So. If you'll stick with me for just a little more, uh, on my, it's called the Jolly Scholar Triple Eight. That's my new persona. I know, I, I like dressing up and whatnot. Uh, my first discussion is gonna be the actual political spectrum, which will follow this. I'm going to tell you something most of you don't know. I know most of you don't know what I'm going to tell you because rather than unfriend people on Facebook, I actually read what you post. How about that? Then I'm going to tell you why you don't know it. So it's going to be interesting. I'm going to tell you something that I know most of you don't know, and then I'm going to tell you why you don't know it, which is actually the real kicker. Surely that's worth a little of your broad-minded, inclusive, highly educated time. So first, 
Discussion number one of my Jolly Scholar Triple Eight series, The Actual Political Spectrum. Then a brief introduction to my concept, excuse me, a brief introduction to my conceptualization of techno-anarchism. Sounds romantic, huh? Yeah, well. And finally, what's with the cigar and libation? But you know what? I got so involved in this, I forgot to smoke my cigar. In fact, I didn't drink any of my libation the whole time I was talking. Ooh, it's good. But I am going to give you a critique of it. And it's a pretty good one. Uh, that's going to be a part of my uh, my platform is discussing libations and cigars. Why not? What good is a revolution if you're not enjoying yourself, huh? Anyways, so if you'll stick with me for a little bit, here goes. Discussion number one, the true political spectrum. Take it away. Okay, greetings for those of you who are stuck with me. Thank you. This is the Jolly Scholar series, Jolly Scholar Triple Eight. And the first discussion number one is the true political spectrum. It's not complicated. It should be right in your face. I know, I won't say it. You went to a university. I said it. Okay. So we have on the far right is anarchism and libertarianism, right? The least amount of government. On the far left, we have socialism. This is the true governmental spectrum, the true political spectrum, and I'll explain it. On the far right is as little government as possible, anarchy, libertarianism. As you move towards democratic republics, the Constitution of the United States, for instance, and others, aristocratic parliaments, aristocrats, or aristocracies, I'm sorry, absolute monarchies, emperors, and then finally, the pinnacle of absolute power and concentrated power is the socialist state. No pharaoh, no king, no Khan ever had the power of a socialist dictator or a socialist dictatorship. No pharaoh, no king, no Khan has ever had the power of a Stalin, of a Kim Jong-un, of a Fidel Castro, of an Adolf Hitler, of a Mussolini. You must understand that, that the pinnacle of concentrated power is the socialist, the socialist state. Okay, but let's start with the, the basic, the basic fundamental of all socialism. Every thought, word, and deed is political. This is Mao, but it's also Marx. It is the function of the state to regulate that which is political, right? That's what the state, that's what it does. Therefore, the state has the function and duty to regulate every thought, word, and deed. There are no limits to what the government may regulate in a socialist state. Okay, so that's the first concept you have to really suck up and understand. Every thought, word, and deed is political, right? Our universities are already, they're little petri dishes. This is where this is coming out of. This is where it's manifesting. Political correctness. Every thought, word, and deed must be processed through the lens of political correctness because every thought, word, and deed is political. There's no such thing as a non-political thought, word, or deed. It gets worse. Your consciousness is a political construct. So, what is socialism? Is it about equality? That is a lie. That's a hoax. That's the, car, that's the, the red cape that the uh, matador puts in front of the public bull to get it to charge. Equality, equality. Really, really? Look at any speech by Fidel Castro, Joseph Stalin, of course, you know, Adolf Hitler, Mao, anybody, Kim Jong-un. Right now, uh, Maduro in, in, uh, in Venezuela. Do they talk about uh, equality after they're in power? No, the answer is no. 
They don't. There's no mention of equality once they're in power. It's a hoax from the start. Why? Why? Socialism is an engineering project. We're going to really tease up that a little bit. A nation cannot be engineered by consensus. Do you understand? It's why Fidel Castro had the... You can find that there, there's a speech he gave where he convinced the public of Cuba after the revolution that they didn't need to vote. He says, why do you, why do you need to vote? We know where we're going. Why, why do we need to vote? <laughs> and, he, and they fell for it. So nobody's a, has been voting in uh, Cuba ever since, except for the party. By the way, look this up. How... What is the percentage of members of the party in any communist state? Look it up. You can go state by state. Start with Russia. It's about 1%. Where do you think they get that figure, the 1%? There's no 1% in, capital, in a capitalist or democracy state. Why not 1.1? One, one, why not 1 1? Why not 2? Why not 3? There's no 1% in the Western capitalist oligarchies. They get together to decide the fate of humanity. No, there isn't. No, there isn't. If you take the 10, 15, 20 richest people on earth, they have nothing in common, most of them. But a nation cannot be engineered by consensus. An engineering project requires absolute control over ever, every aspect of society and over every thought, word, and deed. The final state, excuse me, the final goal is one state, one identity slash consciousness, one ethnicity slash people. Let's dissect that. One state is easy to understand, but one identity consciousness. Those of you who have studied it at all, or we've, even if you haven't studied, you've heard the concept class consciousness. When Marx started out, he had a thing called the species being, where he was trying to establish a relationship between a human consciousness and the product of their labor. It started to fall apart easily, uh, quickly enough. But it was a starting point. And if you read early Marx, he was brilliant. But consciousness has this um, you know, kind of phenomenological aspect to it, which is difficult to deal with. So over the decades, uh, the socialist thinkers got away from consciousness. It was too difficult to... They're not really interested in, in what we call first philosophy, a theory of human consciousness. They had to get that out of the way. But Marx being an, uh, in the German school was still a true philosopher, at least in his youth. Philosophy now has nothing to do with first philosophy, which is a theory or a model to, of consciousness, to understand human consciousness. But if you reduce it to identity, now it's very manageable. Identity is your social identity. What they've managed to do is construe identity with consciousness. You as a human being have no essence, none whatsoever. You have no subjectivity. You are the intersection of competing narratives generated by the elites. It's called discourse theory. Discourse is a substitute for propaganda theory. Truth, propaganda, use the word discourse, sounds better, are synonymous. Right? If you look at the social matrix, the nexus that is every individual human. Discourse is, the, is what's connecting all these nexuses and the socioeconomic factors, social structure. So the intersection between social structure and narratives is what gives you your consciousness. Other than that, you as a human being have no essence. I think they call that essentialism, an unchanging reality through time. So you have been reduced to a, an intersection of socioeconomic forces glued together by discourse, which is propaganda. The discourse is generated by the elites. This is where Chomsky becomes important because he gave the carte blanche to the universities to control speech and discourse by giving a flimsy theory of uh, relationship, uh, supposed relationship between grammar, deep grammar, and consciousness. And it's, it, it's nonsense. Nobody even uses it anymore because there's no need to. They weren't interested in truth to start with, right? Because there isn't any. So, by reducing humanity's consciousness to just identity, they don't have to discuss anything that has to do with phenomenology. 
our consciousness. They can just reduce it to you are your social identity. So now you get it. You're not really black if you don't know who to vote for. The Democratic Party is already in the position of they give you your identity and you represent them. Whereas we on the other side, we elect our representatives and they represent us. We tell them who we are. They don't tell us who we are. But in your party already here in America, your party tells you who you are. It's a nice trick, isn't it? Yeah, it's brilliant. The final goal is one state, one identity. Now remember, Mussolini was a communist before he became a fascist. Everything in the state, nothing outside of it. So you have one state, one identity, one ethnicity or people. We're going to get to that. So there's two classes in a socialist state. There's the engineers, the party, and there's you, <laughs> the people. The contempt that socialist elites have for the people is palpable. Look at it already. Everybody who didn't vote for Hillary Clinton is a deplorable redneck, racist, fascist, right? Yeah, that's how it works. You scratch a commie and you have an aristocrat. If you study the life of Marx, he lived like an aristocrat. He sponged off of everybody. He stole most of his ideas from Engels. He was never poor. That's a lie. He lived off everybody around him. And when he inherited money, he was a spendthrift. He lived high on the hog. Please, everybody, you really got to snap out of it. So one state, one identity. Forget about human consciousness now. You don't have to deal with that anymore. And the stickler is one ethnicity, one people. We'll get to that. But there's two classes, the engineering class, the party, and you. You cannot engineer a people by consensus. You really need to suck that in. You must have absolute power. There's no other way to do it. We have 320 something million people here. And we can't agree on hardly anything. How do you think you could get an engineering project started that you're going to engineer the whole population by consensus? You're going to vote on that? Are you crazy? No, you're not going to vote on it, believe me. So then we get to what's the difference between on the far left, the communist, global communism and national socialism, the fascists, the Nazis. Remember, Nazi stands for National Socialist Workers' Party. Workers' Party. You get it? The National Socialist Workers' Party? Reem, or Rome, was a homosexual, it's neither here nor there, but the night of the uh, Crystal Nice when they came for him and they killed him, uh, they didn't kill him right away, I don't think, but he was in bed with his boyfriend, young, a young fellow. Uh, the point is, he was more of a communist. See, at that time, communism and uh, fascism were, were still intertwined because they were all socialists. The brown shirts were communists within the National Socialists, or at least leaning too far. And that's one of the reasons that uh, they were purged. But in a communist or fascism, it's still the same principle. Every thought, word, and deed is political, right? Nothing outside of the state, everything inside of it. Everything inside the state, nothing outside of it. That's Mussolini. But what's the distinction between, at least theoretically, socialism, national socialism on the right, and global communism on the left? One of the defining characteristics is state-run capitalism. Okay. Keep that in mind. State-controlled religion and a national ethnicity. Here's how the fascists will start off with an ethnicity and murder their way up to a socialist state. The communists will start with a socialist state and murder their way down to a common ethnicity. They'll either breed it, purge, whatever they have to do. And I'm going to give you some very good examples. But first, I want you to think about the movie Clockwork Orange. Remember when the, the uh, protagonist or antagonist, whatever, 
Roddy McDowell. He's being conditioned, right, for his evil ways. And uh, he stumbles through the, uh, the corridors of this Gulag Archipelago. Go, I mean, it's, it's not really the Gulag, it's, but it's very similar. And he stumbles down the hallway and he finds his way into the room. And there's a person, there's a creature there. It's half human and half pig. Do you understand? It's planned biology. You're being engineered, ladies and gentlemen. This is the fundamentals of socialism, to engineer you. You will be engineered. Planned parenthood. <laughs> They're not planning for parenthood, stupid. Come on. Planned parenthood is the parallel to planned economy. Just hold it there. When you look at China today, is the People's Communist, whatever, Communist Party of China, the People's Communist Party, right? Don't start with this, who's not a real communist country. That's every time that you liberals are faced with communism, you say, oh, that's not really communism. Who taught you to say that? How the hell would you know? I mean, really, how would you know? You're telling the Chinese people, the Chinese government, they don't know that they're communists? They're not, they're not right communists? You're going to explain it to them? Who the hell are you? You think they don't know who they are? It's you that don't know who they are. They know perfectly well who they are. China has now state-run capitalism. Every socialist state does. Capitalism is too, it's too powerful. It's the best economic tool that we have. But keep in mind, capitalism is a tool. It's not really an ism. It's like having hammerism. All right? A hammer, you can build a house with it, you can smash somebody's head with it, you can nail somebody to a cross with it. There's no hammerism. It's just a tool. Capitalism is an economic tool. It's not even a system. That's also a misnomer, but I digress. Does China have state control capitalism? Absolutely. Does it have state control religion? Absolutely. In fact, they made a deal with Pope Francis right now. Pope. Okay, let's not go there. Uh, that they will appoint the bishops. Christianity is huge in China. Buddhism is very large, and so is Taoism. And all of them are controlled by the state. Now, is there a common ethnicity? Yes, it is the Han. Sorry, people. You need to think about that. There are other ethnicities all over China, but the Han are the dominant, and they are slowly purging all the others. What's with the Uyghurs? You think it's just because they're Muslims? No, they're also another ethnicity. Now, notice, and you're going to love this, they have declared Islam to be a mental disorder. What do you people call anybody who criticizes Islam? Islamophobic, right? The weaponization of the health system, of healthcare. It's a long story. What do you think the Russians were doing in the Gulag Archipelago? Read Solzhenitsyn for Christ's sake. China has state-run capitalism, state-controlled religions. They are now populating Tibet with Han and basically slowly exterminating the Tibetan people. They are now rounding up Uyghurs, and they'll slowly be exterminating them. In Stalinist Russia, if you look at the rise of the Bolsheviks, there were lots of Jews. They were instrumental in the rise of, uh, of, of communism in Russia. I'm going to do uh, an interesting discussion on, yeah, Pete Seeger. Where have all the flowers gone? If I had a hammer, he was a rat. Not because he was a communist. I think he, he meant well, and I think he got appalled at what he himself did. We're, we're going to talk about what Seeger did to Bob Dylan, but more so what he did to Paul Robeson in the second Peacekill riot. Uh, it's going to be an interesting discussion. But it's related to what I was telling you about under Stalinist Russia. Paul Robeson was a communist too, interesting guy, very brave. And uh, he had a lot of uh, Jewish support here in New York, here in America. Uh, communists, obviously. And then he had counterpart supporters in Russia. And he liked uh, Stalin, and he never did actually denounce Stalin. 
I think the guy was really kind of innocent. He just didn't understand. But he went to Russia on a couple of trips, on his last trips there, uh, and he was asking for his Jewish benefactors or friends that he knew. And Stalin would tell him, oh, well, they're off somewhere else, and I don't know if they can get here in time, but, but you, you'll see them. And then, of course, he never did. One of the reasons why is because they were being purged. That's right. Stalin was purging the Jews. That's why we have so many uh, Russian Jews here in America. Uh, there was a wave before that, but that there's a very recent waves that happened during communism. Uh, Stalin had a great idea. He was going to give a little country to the Jews, make a little Jewish enclave. And he wanted all the Jews to move there. What do you think would have happened to them? Oh, the, oh they, they were wise to that. They got their asses out of there. So, again, the people of absolute power are going to create their own ethnicity. In the case of Russia, there were white Russians. In the case of China, it's the Han. In the case of Europe right now, you can see that there's an engineering project going with the entire population. It's a whole other subject. But what you have to keep in mind is that the communists will murder or breed or whatever they do, or whether, they're going, whether their, their strategy is in that particular country, particular area, and murder it down, genocide it down, breed it down, whatever they're going to do. There will be one ethnicity by the time they're through. The National Socialists will murder on the way up. Either way, either way you're going to get some kind of genocide because they're going to reconstruct the new human. It's, it's not an exaggeration, everybody. All you have to do is look. Look this up. This is not uh, esoteric knowledge. All you have to do is look. It's right there. Look what's going on in Europe today. And I'll be doing some discussions on that. Uh, Sweden is, is a very good example. At any rate, state-run capitalism, state-controlled religion, and national ethnicity. Even if they breed a new brown race of a mixture of everybody, uh, whatever, it doesn't matter. It's going to be one ethnicity. So multiculturalism is an oxymoron. It's an utter misunderstanding of the term culture. The Frankfurt School began a thing called cultural Marxism. It's too involved a subject right now, but one of the things that I contributed, I think, to the field is a concept of what is culture. And the Marxists were onto it, though. And that is, politics is downstream of culture, because that's where values are established. But culture is downstream. This is my contribution to religious experience, the varieties of religious experience. Uh, I'm not going to go into this now and try to sell you on it, but I even stick to politics is downstream of culture. Okay, fine. They realized that they could not generate culture. So they had to then restart the whole process. And that's where they are now. Cultural Marxism is what they're doing here, what they've done in Europe. It's going to implode. All communism implodes. And that will be another discussion where we'll talk about that. But right now, what is the distinction between left socialism and right socialism. That's all it is. One state, one class, one identity, and one people. State-run capitalism, state control religion, and a national ethnicity. So if I could just put it into a very simple meme that I hope you remember. All communism manifests as fascism. Do you understand? It doesn't matter what they start off. It manifests as fascism. It's what Mussolini and Hitler realized right from the start, that there's no other way for it to go. It has to go there. And consequently, it has never failed to go exactly there. Now, how do you keep explaining that? Oh, that's not real communism. That's not real communism. Who knows what real communism is? You? You don't. Obviously, you don't. You don't have a clue. You're trying to say that Stalin, Mao, Fidel, Maduro, Kim Jong-un, they don't know, Pol Pot. No, they knew perfectly well. Hitler, Mussolini, they knew perfectly well. Remember, Mussolini was a communist before he became a fascist. He said 
This is a quicker way to communism, to socialism, sorry. And that's what they all realize. So China now has state control capitalism, state control religion, and a national ethnicity. And they are purging all the other ethnicities. This has never failed everyone. The reason that doesn't, uh, there's no ethnicity change in Cuba because Cuba was so mixed from the start that there's nothing to do there. The Cubans are extremely nationalistic people though. That's a whole other story. You ask any Cuban, is he black or brown or white or a Cuban? What's more important? They will tell you, it's being Cuban. But I digress. Oh, it went out. When I get to talking too much, it goes out. Here's the libation. The libation of the day. It's good. So when the communists will tell you that the abolition of capitalism, abolition of religion, transnationalism, it, it never happens that way. It manifests as fascism because it has to. The abolition of family or ethnicity and replacement by complete identity with the state. Yes, you have only one identity and that's the identity of the state. And this will happen in China too. It will happen in all of them eventually. The family is to be deconstructed so that your only identity is a direct identity with the state. The state gives you your identity. You have no identity other than the identity of the state. It's the only permitted identity. You have no brother, you have no sister, you have no clan, you have no tribe. You have no essence. You have no consciousness as a human being. You are an intersection of social political forces put together by discourse. It's extremely perverse when you really look at it, and it's extremely false. Once you understand that socialism is an engineering project and look around at what's going on, it starts to make sense. You cannot, cannot engineer a population by consensus. Look to the universities. They're already completely fascist. Who runs them? The tenured professors. <laughs> they can't be fired. It's beautiful, isn't it? How do you get into the faculty? How do you become a tenured faculty? You must be invited. How do you become a member of the Communist Party? Do you think you can join? You can't join the party, fool. You get invited. Otherwise, you can't get in. Who do you think they're going to invite? Yeah, you have to prove just to what a brown nose you have. It's a euphemism. We on the right, that is the anarchists, libertarians, constitutional uh, Republicans, we cannot be fascists. We're not socialists of any stripe. Progressive liberal, communist, fascist, it doesn't matter. National socialist. At least get your categories straight. I know yelling fascist makes you feel so good. I mean, it gets you going. I know, I know. So you'll probably keep doing it anyways. But at least have in your mind, at least be aware that you're completely wrong. We're not the fascists. We have nothing to do with socialism. You are the fascists. And the reason you don't know this is because of universities. You're a creature of the university system and they don't want you to know this. Racist! Fascist! Socialism is an engineering project. You cannot engineer a population by consensus. Socialism requires absolute power concentrated in the tiniest number of people possible. That's why in the case of Stalin, it was down to one person. In communist China with Mao, four people determined from cradle to grave the future, the destiny, and every thought, word, and deed of one-fifth of the population of the world at the time. All Marxism, all socialism manifests as fascism 
and it's deliberate. I am certain that almost none of you understood, or at least before I explained it to you, what I just told you. Again, don't take my word for it. Look it up yourselves. Look this up yourselves. So I've just told you something you don't know, right? I know I did. And number two, now I'll tell you why you don't know it. Because this is the real kicker. Because most of you went to a university. <laughs> it's fucking beautiful, isn't it? Sorry. But it is. It's beautiful, isn't it? I mean, what did Khrushchev say? Remember Khrushchev, if you don't look him up. We will bury you through your education system. Yeah. Isn't the university poison now seeping down into all levels of education, right down uh, to the kindergartens? Yeah, it is. It is. Take a look. Where do all the teachers come from? <laughs> the universities. They have to get a degree. Why do you think the teachers' union is so against charter schools or homeschooling? Come on, think about it. I thought you want diversity. Yeah. Diversity, my ass. There's no diversity in socialism, people. None. Zero. There's no multiculturalism. That is an utter misunderstanding of the concept of culture. And the fact is, most of you, especially here in America and the West, you don't even understand your own culture. Why do you pretend to understand the cultures of other people? Really? Anyway. So there you have it. I told you something you don't know. I know you didn't know it. Because, I, like I said, I pay attention to you on Facebook. And number two, I told you why you don't know it. Because you went to a university. I mean, it just doesn't get any richer than that, does it? Because you've been educated. Anyways, that's it for Jolly Scholar, Triple Eight. If you want to see me at my websites, they're posted below. I'll try to put them up. I think they're up there now. And if you're still going to stick with me, I am going to attach a little... Um, explanation of techno-anarchism. Thank you. Space, the final frontier. These are the voyages of the starship Enterprise. Its five-year mission to explore strange new worlds, to seek out new life and new civilizations, to boldly go where no man has gone before. I think my love for science fiction is what's given me such a positive um, attitude or, or an optimistic feeling about technology that maybe it could really be put to some, um, well, it's already been put to fantastic use, but it, combined with my fascination with anarchist philosophy, I thought it was a natural progression for me. And I think it could be a natural progression for philosophy in general. I'll be elaborating a lot more on this as I go along with the uh, series. Well, welcome back. For those of you stuck with me. If you Thank you. Thank you, that's great. Okay, so let's look at what I mean by techno-anarchism. I'm, I'm going to explain in very simple terms. Uh, I'll be doing videos on this, and I have a whole website devoted to it, which is going to be a bit separate from my Jolly Scholar, although, of course, I'll start it with the Jolly Scholar uh, website, because I really want to establish a kind of um, community of people contributing. So I don't want it to be really my website. So let's start with, if you're on the far left, you're, or just leftists, your your great fear is the oligarchy, those rich people. Those rich people are going to run the government. They will run your lives and they'll make people poor and blah, blah, blah. And, and there's a lot of truth to it. So to the left, the fear is the oligarchy, the elites. To the right, the fear is government. Government will own everything eventually, which is what socialism is. To the left, the concentrated power of elites through capitalism will end up owning everything worth owning, and whatever they don't own, they don't want to because it's not worth anything. So in either case, 
your lives are completely regulated by these elites, whichever side. What I'm trying to do with techno-anarchism is to actually get out of this dichotomy. I don't even like attacking socialism. Yes, I think it's, it's, it's one of the great perversions of history. But nonetheless, that's not the point. The real problem is the concentration of power, because without it, you can't have socialism. And without it, you can't have elites dominating you. So what I'm trying to do is create a, a model of what I call non-oppressibleness. I, I may come up with a better term, but right, that's what I'm using for now. My hope is that technology has reached the state that if we use it correctly, and by that I mean the individual. I remember, I didn't really go into a discussion of anarchism. Anarchism is the individual. It is a great yes to life. It's a great yes to humanity. To me, socialism is a big fat no. People are stupid and they must be engineered like cattle. And they, these brilliant uh, socialist leaders will engineer the population into what it should be. As Stalin said, people don't want to become what they are not. That's a nice way of putting it. No, it's not that nobody wants to become what they are not. Everybody wants to transcend the self. Everybody wants to become greater than what they are. It's that they don't want to be what Stalin wanted them to be. That's what they don't want. The great, uh, to me, the, the what I love about the Constitution and uh, the principles of our uh, founding fathers, and I mean it, ideological, ideological fathers, not necessarily blood fathers, was the incredible optimism towards the individual. And this will be a very interesting discussion too, because that optimism is born, I, I'm telling you, it's, it's Christianity. Uh, it's not proletizing for Christianity. It's the concept of the eternal soul in that everybody has eternity balancing within the decisions that they make in this little twinkling of an eye. However absurd you may find it, and you may find it absurd, still it's the basis that says that the individual can determine, can at least formulate a concept of his own destiny and should be free to pursue it that the happiest, most fulfilled human being is the human being that is fulfilling or pursuing his own destiny, even if he fails. Now, for some human beings, serving other people, serving other things, that, that's their destiny. That's what they want. And that's fine. And you may fail even at that. But it's better to fail at pursuing your own destiny than it is to pursue a destiny that has been determined by someone else. It's like an atomic explosion. Every little atom, individuals, as they explode, they hit the other one, they hit the other one, and you have this incredible energy. And that's what we're looking for. And anarchism, the closest thing to anarchism right now is actually the United States Constitution. Okay, we'll talk about the Constitution in another discussion as well, uh, comparing, comparing it with the uh, Articles of Confederation. The Constitution has some flaws in it, but they're not what most people are saying. The flaw is that it does allow for a, a way too much concentration of power. It's another discussion, though. My hope is that technology can enable communities of people to become non-oppressible. One of the first things you want to get rid of is ideology. Remember, the Constitution is not based on an ideology at all. There's no ideology. Its Judeo-Christian values are at the fundamental center of it, but they don't necessarily have to be. I mean, that's another discussion, sorry. But that's the values. But it's not an ideology. It's conservatism, the definition is, take what is good, get rid of what is bad. Take what is good, get rid of what is bad. And you progress like that. So we have checks and balances in the government, etc. You learn by living. I am seeing more and more ideology as being a, a mental disorder, a kind of disease. And yes, I'm saying socialism is a, is a mental disease. 
And all you have to do is look at the banshees coming out of the universities, and it's hard to convince yourself that that's not true. But again, I don't want to get into that. What I really want to discuss is, regardless of left and right, if communities can come together, what we call platformism and anarchy, to, in fact, make themselves non-oppressible, then you, you render the whole argument mute. Who is going to oppress us? Where is the concentration of power going to come from, these rich oligarchs or this demonic uh, government? It doesn't matter, because they can't. And you don't have to go too far with this, mind you. As long as communities can make the price of oppressing them so heavy that it's not worth an organized state to do it, this state will in fact do what many of the anarchists before were claiming. It will wither away. We can have a state by consensus to whatever degree we need it. But if people can form communities that are non-oppressible and not subject, subjected to or uh, infested with ideologies. So that's the basis of what I'm working on with the model of techno-anarchism, is that we can make ourselves non-oppressible with the new technologies. And I have uh, right now I've developed six points of resistance perpetual resistance. I'm looking at, uh, of course, uh, cryptocurrency, which will decentralize the banking system, 3D printing and the new digital uh, manufacturing to decentralize the means of, uh, the means of production. This is a pretty good story where I'm going. I'm identifying the areas of points of resistance that can create a community that is non-oppressible, free of what I call uh, the disease of ideology. And you could say, well, that's, that's far-fetched, it's, um, you know, pie in the sky. Well, it's not nearly as far-fetched as uh, communism, <laughs> I mean, really. The romantic notion of revolution, which is to replace a government with a government you think is going to be better, has been proven for the last 120 years to utterly, not just fail, but backfire because you are being used. Bakunin, and I'm going to do a really good dissertation on Bakunin, smelled a rat with Marx from the very beginning. His nose was good. Marx was a rat. But the main point is, is that this idea of romantic revolution with the guns, I mean, it's, 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 it's attractive, right? I mean, it's, I know a lot of the guys in the streets there, you know, with their black pajamas or like what I was doing when I was a rock star. I mean, I wasn't a rock star. We were trying to be, right? But when you're a rock and roll musician, you're really like a little band of uh, Vikings going on, I don't want to say rape, but uh, you know, sex and drugs and rock and roll, plunder and pillaging as you go. Oh, that'd be a good song. It's exciting. Yes, revolution. Anarchy. Go in the streets and fight them. Yeah, we love that. Yeah, it's it's very attractive, but it doesn't work. It's it's a total backfire at this point. To make ourselves non-oppressible, I think now is the way to go. And I call it kind of designer, designer anarchism, designer revolution, because it's based around individuality and individual communities that come together and form allegiances, alliances that make themselves non-oppressible. I think if you think it through, you might agree that if anything could work, this might be it. At any rate, if you're curious, I will continue to, um, to publish on this, to speak on this, uh, my discussions. I'm going to invite other people to, to engage in discussions about uh, just a, a new way for the goal of, of the new anarchism, which I'm calling techno-anarchism. So anyways, if you've made it this far with me, thank you very much. Now I'm going to do a little interlude with a piece of mine that's called uh, uh, Nurai, which was a, a girl I met in, uh, 
in Turkey. So you can see it's flamenco, but it's kind of a fusion, kind of based on what I would call a taksim. And, um, well, after that, I'll discuss the, uh, the cigar on the libation. Thank you.